I'm a feminist, but I made a movie. Lots of men said they were going to make it over the years, but they never did. And then a woman came along, a producer, and she said, I'm going to make this. And she did. There's going to be a premiere at the Leicester Square Odeon on the 19th of March, and you can come. Tickets start at £10 and you can buy them at the Odeon website. Just go to guiltyfeminist.com. On the homepage, it says Say My Name, which is the name of the movie, hashtag Say My Name Movie, and you will see a link straight through, or you can Google Say My Name Odeon. Just to declare, I'm wearing a long black dress with a plunging neckline because I won't have time for a phone call with all of you on the night. But the dress code is glam and you can take that however you like, even if that's your favourite feminist t-shirt. See you there. Please come. There's going to be a Q&A at the end with me and Sindhu V. I want you all there on my big night. Lots of love. And now on to the podcast. I'm a feminist, but last night I was having drinks with Cal Wilson and Susie Youssef. And Cal was talking about a time that she was sort of a bit out of it and non compassmentous at Disneyland. And I said, it sounds like you were roofied at Disneyland, Cal. And she's, and Susie Yusuf said, no, at Disneyland it's goofied. <laughs> and then Cal said, isn't it, it was funny to think that Goofy's real name is Go Hypnol. <laughs> and I laughed about that for 10 minutes. <laughs> and then said, I wish you'd said that on The Guilty Feminist but I'd probably never make a roofie joke on that show. Because <laughs> I don't want the audience to know what I'm really like. <laughs> Imagine if Goofy's real name was Gohibnol. Yeah, no, they, yeah. they were some solid jokes in the part, but I was disappointed that I was like, this is burnt, this is wasted. But I yeah. found a way to bring your comedy from the pub onto this stage. And I like the way that you've given both Susie and I the responsibility for making a roofie joke. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I'll throw those two under the bus. <laughs> Listen, I'm a feminist, but I used to think I could only be funny in trousers. Always used to wear trousers on stage, because like, if I wear a skirt, they'll know I'm a girl. Or a Scottish man, who knows. But it did, it took me ages to actually like wear a dress on stage. A lot of comedians say that. They say they worry about being too attractive on stage because... That's some... what I was doing. <laughs> It's they won't be able to concentrate. Whatever that means for them. You know, that's, that's not necessarily a skirt. Not everyone has a femme gender expression, but whatever that means for them, a lot of women say, mm. I'm worried about being too sexy on stage in case it undermines the comedy or the audience sort of go against me. I've never once heard a cis man say, I just worry about being too sexy on stage. Yeah. <laughs> it's never... I, I've... And do you know why I've never heard it? Not one of them has ever said it. In the history of the world, in the history of comedy living or dead, from before I was born, it hasn't been said. I can say that for an actual fact. And also, they've never said, I should probably take the iPhone out of my front pocket of my skinny jeans because it looks like shit. They all just stand on stage with their phones in their pockets. Like, that must be uncomfortable. You're radiating your scrotum. I'm a feminist, but I thought my yoga teacher was so hot this week, I was delighted when I was slightly unaligned and he had to readjust me. Were you, like, deliberately lying wonky? No, like... no, I would never do that. I was simply accidentally unaligned. And then did you keep slipping out of alignment? <laughs> oh, I've done it again! Please adjust! I don't know why you sound like that in yoga, but... No, I sound like Britney. <laughs> Oops, I did it again. Na -na -na -na. <laughs> Downward facing dog. Reverse warrior. Shavasana. Well, we've learnt a lot about Deborah. <laughs> All the yoga positions I know. <laughs> um, I'm a feminist, but once I was talking to a very attractive man before a podcast recording, and because I was gazing up at him so sincerely, when I took a sip of my drink, the straw went straight up my nose. <laughs> and when I pulled the glass away, the straw was still in my nose. And then when I pulled the straw out, my nose started bleeding profusely. Oh, oh. And then it was time for the podcast. <laughs> he was such a lovely man, he just acted like he hadn't seen anything happen. Are you sure you weren't in a Sandra Bullock movie and actually Sandra Bullock? Because that sounds a lot like... We were you. in a bus that couldn't go below 50 kilometres an hour. 
That's not the kind of Sandra Bullock movie that I was talking about. <laughs> I was talking about the ones where she falls over in front of Hugh Grant. <laughs> Sandy, if you're listening, you're very welcome on the show. Oh, yes. If Kanye can't make it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a feminist, but just before the show, I was a bit late out onto the stage. If anyone noticed, I think you started the, the, all the signals from the room yes, said... <laughs> wow. Well, you're, you're it's, like, it's like having a, like a conscience four rows back, it's isn't so, it? Shouldn't have said that. Really, I mean, you better hope now I'm not going to say I was so ill and I had to throw up. Mm. And I, I was saving, saving a, a child, penguin. saving a child, mm. yeah, saving a baby penguin, saving a child's baby penguin. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I didn't come out onto the stage when you were expecting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because I had to run to the loo at the last minute. And so I didn't have time to shut the door properly. I mean, I had shut it, but I didn't have time to lock it because I thought, oh, you know, they're waiting. And somebody opened it and went, oh, sorry. And I was really pleased I had my nice knickers on. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but recently I took great pleasure in cleaning out my iron using a sock and a cat toy. <laughs> It's not really, not really, I'm a feminist, but really, it's more, I'm a cat lady, but. Yeah. What made you think, oh, my iron needs a clean? Because the water oh. had gone mouldy. Yeah, yeah, but then what made you think, I'll do it with a cat toy? Well, because I needed it, the, the cat toy was like, a, it's like a long plastic stick and it's got a little pink fluffy thing on the end. So I put a sock on it because I figured that the fabric of the sock would be able to get down into the tank of yeah. the iron and I'd be able to rub the sock along the sides of the iron with the cat toy. Really, I could have popped some bleach in and just shaken it up, but I was like, no, I'm going to MacGyver the shit out of this. And the cat was very upset afterwards. It's funny, though. I do know what you mean, that if you enjoy something super domestic, you do feel like you're selling yourself out as a feminist. Mm. Does anyone else feel like that? If they secretly get satisfaction from the ironing, they think to themselves, oh, I'm playing right into the hands of the patriarchy, but look at the collar on that. Oh, that's... <laughs> Have you got any more? No, that's okay, it. Okay, great. I've actually, I've got, I'm a cat lady, but sometimes I pet dogs. <laughs> Which is not even true, because I don't even know how to pet a dog properly. Because I don't know how hard you have to pet it before the pet goes through, because they have like longer fur than cats, and so I don't know whether you're like, supposed to like, like kind of beat them like a carpet. Like, will they feel it? He's like, do you know, I said that the other night, and a guy in the audience in the front row went, oh, for God's sake, you do it like this, and he patted his friend. It was amazing, he just kind of, he kind of scruffled the guy's hair and then I was like, can I have a go? And he went, sure. The friend, not the friend who was being scruffled, but the guy doing the scruffling was like, yeah, you have a go. And so I patted the man and I was like, oh right, so you just kind of scruffle, you kind of do that. And then after the gig, the man who'd been patted came up to me and went, I feel like I should introduce myself to you now that you've patted me. And I said, I don't need to know your name to know that you're a good boy. <laughs> Live from the Factory Theatre, Sydney, The Spontaneous Show presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Mel Wilson, with very special guests, Susie Yusuf and Darcy Munnis, talking about everything. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Today I'm here in Sydney, Australia with Cal Wilson talking about empathy. It's amazing, I always feel with Guilty Feminist audiences when you come out and you are just a wall of sound, I feel like if I went, let's go out and overturn a bus, you'd be like, yes! They would, and that is dangerous. <laughs> I was in a cult when I was younger. <laughs> and and now so, you've started your own. Oh, it's really easy to start a cult accidentally. Because um, <laughs> it's in you, it's sort of the fabric of your being, you know. Um, I feel like we'll know the warning signs will be when you start taking like 12 husbands or something like that. Start. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Zelinski will always be number one. And that's, he knows that. He knows, he knows he'll always be first husband. <laughs> But the others like will change depending on their behaviour for the week, like their rankings can change oh, well, on the husband matter. Yeah, to do it sort of almost like a Yelp review situation. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, keep them on their toes. Uber ratings. Excellent. <laughs> I was so delighted when you did a bit of stand-up the other night about hating the word hubby. Oh, my you... worst thing is when somebody refers to my husband as hubby. You know, when they just go, and is hubby coming? <laughs> oh, I could get violent. <laughs> I say, do you mean my husband? I said it to someone the other day. I went, oh, do you mean my husband? Because I couldn't stand it. And I do you know equally almost equally hate when my, someone calls my mother mum. How's mum? Would, how's mum? Would mum like to sit down? Oh, what, I just... hate, what I hated when I was pregnant is that people would call me mum. And it's like, unless you are in my uterus, you can't call me mum. <laughs> and even if you are, it's going to be tricky. It's going to be alarming. <laughs> mum! Give me another coffee! It's cramped in here and I don't have Netflix! <laughs> I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fetus, get me out of here. This is a great reality show. Celebrity fetuses in utero. I'm just, I'm just pitching the ideas. I don't know how to make them work. Not all of them can be gold, but I'm just saying they've got cameras, haven't they? They've got endoscopic cameras. Are you telling me that if Kim Kardashian was pregnant again, she wouldn't do that? She would. If the technology was there. I think it's unwise to give her the idea. Too late, she listens to this show for a fact. Oh, imagine, imagine if Kanye started listening to The Guilty Feminist. Oh. Imagine that. I'm a feminist, but I would like that. <laughs> I mean, it would be enjoyable. I think he'd disagree with a lot, wouldn't he, Kanye? If we could get Kanye on as a guest to discuss with him some of his issues, I mean, it would be much more a sort of, I don't know, Jeremy Paxman. What's the late night show here that, where they grill the politicians? Q&A. It would be much more Q&A than a normal Guilty Feminist interview. Normal Guilty Feminist interview is lovely and inclusive and warm and welcome to our guests and we love having you here. I mean, with Kanye, we'd have to be a little stricter, wouldn't we? I think so. Or it would be like, oh, look, you've got a great feminist podcast, but I do the best feminist podcast in the world. <laughs> do a bit of that. Take your awards. <laughs> I think it's I, not a good idea to get him on. I'm just no, putting that out there. I'm not convinced that it's the most obvious booking for us. Did but you, did you if see they the, offered me, I would say yes to it, you, just because I'd have to. Did you see the great thing uh, for Valentine's Day? He put like hundreds of single oh. roses and vases on the floor of the living room and then made Kenny G play. Yeah, I don't think he made him. I think he invited him to. There was no... There was no implication that it was a gunpoint. Oh, no, I think he was quite pleased to play. But do you think Kim came in and was like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> no, because she tweeted it and said, oh, look how amazing my life is. I actually quote tweeted it. Because did you see it? It was Kenny G in the living room playing clarinet. And then there were... Sex, sex just, clarinet. Can you imagine coming home and finding Kenny G playing clarinet in the living room? But there were like hundreds of individual roses in glass vases. And I quote tweeted it saying, that's so weird because that's exactly the date I set up for Ross Geller last year on Valentine's. <laughs> Nobody knows that reference. Okay. All right. What I thought was interesting about it was looking at the picture of their living room. It was quite small. <laughs> wow. But also... Are you judging the Kanye Kardashian living room as too small? I was just expecting it to have like a moat or something in it. You know, like I was expecting it to be grander, but there's just Kenny G amongst a whole lot of bottles. Like... <laughs> but then, like, it's not if, what you're expecting. If Kenny G was a cat, he'd just be like, bang, 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 bang. <laughs> If you did that for me for Valentine's Day, if you set up like hundreds of little vases with mm, roses in them and then just would. let my cats go through going bang, 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 I'd be like, I will love you forever. It would be like your cats playing pinball. Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's an idea for a game. Write it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, empathy. We need it. As fe it's part of the bedrock of feminism, actually. Let me make an argument for that. One woman making the world better for herself isn't feminism. It's just one woman making the world better for herself. Case in point, Theresa May, my prime minister. She is doing things for herself and other people like her. So rich, white, posh people, particularly rich people, and her sort of circle of friends. And that's how they all operate. So David Cameron is fine. Like he caused the whole Brexit scenario and he's absolutely fine because he will always be rich. He's now on the speaker circuit charging 50 grand to give a quick talk at an investment bank and explain why Boris Johnson is a cunt. <laughs> now, while he is correct on that matter, he is correct on no other matter. 
so he's fine. Like, he's going to be fine. So it doesn't really matter what he does. He can bring in austerity. He can cause this catastrophic situation for the UK. He can do whatever he wants, and he's always going to be fine. And so when Theresa May does that, that's no better. She's not helping women. She's certainly not helping women who are in a worse situation than her. She's only help If she is helping women, she's accidentally helping women like her, if you see what I mean, or deliberately helping women like her with tax breaks, for example. Whereas feminism is about a woman helping other women, not just herself, go forward, get up a ladder, knock a barrier out of the way, smash a ceiling, they polish a floor. These like fall, terrible fall. builders. They're, like serious, like bulldozer building to the ground, set off fireworks in a letterbox. I don't know, other things the suffragettes did. Threw themselves under horses? No, that was an accident. Now, it was. Was it really? Mm. Oh. Mm. The other suffragettes didn't like it either. They were like, I mean, they were bummed out also that she died, but um, <laughs> devastated that she died. But they also were like, it's not helped. Um, <laughs> no, they did not like it. It didn't actually do... To distract everything. She didn't mean to do it. She meant to jump out and cause a scene, but she bought oh. a ticket for a party that night and a return train ticket. Oh, oh. Oh, I'm I've so ruined the show. I, Let's I'm go home. I'm so glad I brought I've it up. I've destroyed the... Sorry, too soon. Um, Let's talk about Kenny G again. Let's talk about Kenny G. Okay, all right. Uh, so, yeah, so we need empathy because you have to understand how someone else thinks and how someone else feels in order to include them. You need to be thinking, oh, what if I were that person or what if I were that group of people? And so feminism is the bedrock of feminism. What are your thoughts on empathy, Cal? I feel like if you can make something better for someone, why wouldn't you do that? I feel like I have got less sympathetic to people and more empathetic to people as I've got older and had life experiences where I go, if I see someone in a situation that is their own making, they can get out of that situation, I don't really have much sympathy for that. But if I know that they can't get out of that situation, I have a lot of empathy for them. Like I understand things aren't black and white anymore. And, and you know, I've got a kid and I want him to grow up to be empathetic and mm. respectful of other people as well. And so I guess that makes, you, makes me look at my own behaviour and go, am I modelling a good thing? To this child? I have no children, so I rarely think about that. <laughs> I just lie around at home in a bathrobe watching Netflix, <laughs> going, you know what? There's no one here to see. So it's. <laughs> I wasn't implying I'm that, not on, that people that no, no, children I aren't I know, I know just... I won't. I wasn't even being sarcastic. It sounds like I was it's sort of totally going, dead. oh, you're throwing shade at my barren womb. But, <laughs> but I know that you're a very good. If I were upset about it, I wouldn't be able to say barren womb, so it's fine. <laughs> but I do have a barren womb, so it's okay for me to say it. It's not okay for Cal to say it, no. like she did backstage. <laughs> yes, but I was talking about the royal family, uh, and Baron Womb is the head of that royal oh. family. There's also Baroness Womb and the Viscount Womb as well. They're a German from Hanover. <laughs> They're a German secret royal family. Yes, oh, actually, and they pronounce it "voom" as well. So <laughs> they're quite fast. Voom. <laughs> I'm glad we've come here. <laughs> so what I what I think so I, I think of you of DF, as DFW, like. Um, when you yeah, know you do. your DF dubs is your Twitter handle and stuff Twitter, like that, Facebook, yeah. but I think oh, DFW really. is too long to say, and so I'm going with DFW. Nice, <laughs> I like it. People of Earth, please welcome to the stage DFW. <laughs> generation coming up are, are snowflakes. That's often something said. You're getting offended on behalf of other people. And I always think, why is that an accusation? That's amazing. That's the highest form of empathy to get offended on behalf of people who aren't there, whose life experience you haven't shared. And it feels to me like this new generation, like the young millennials and the Gen Zs, were bitten by a giant radioactive spider who was really good at seeing things from other people's points of view. <laughs> Which doesn't explain why the spider bit them, 
if it was so empathetic. <laughs> Maybe it was an accident. I'm not clear. But at the moment, specifically this week, young people around the world took the day off school not to smoke behind the bike sheds because smoking puts toxins into the environment and is bad for the world, but to march against climate change. Did you see this? And one of the British MPs, Andrea Ledson, if you don't know, she lost against Theresa May when she ran against her to see who could drive our country most effectively off a cliff. <laughs> and Andrea Ledson on Twitter said, it's not a strike uh, that these young people have done, it's called truancy. The truancy, Andrea Ledson, and all of the horrible people who you like who are saying the same thing, is when a child is not engaged and can't be asked to go to school. It's not when a child is marching on Parliament to school a government. And yeah, maybe they took a day off school, but the problems they're bringing to Parliament are if the UN were to give Andy and Tina 12 years to slow climate change and the temperature was rising exponentially, how many years would it take before Andy and Tina realised that climate change would be a runaway train after that and how fast would the train be travelling until it came crashing off the rails and killed the human race and all animals except cockroaches? <laughs> the point is, there's a reason why this generation is getting offended on behalf of other people. When minority groups get offended on behalf of themselves, nothing changes. Minority groups have been getting offended for centuries and things are still pretty much the same or a little bit better, but way not good enough. So when there's some obnoxious guy sitting in the corner of the pub or the internet using homophobic slurs as a joke and somebody who is not LGBTQ says, hey mate, that's not good enough. He goes, oh, you're getting offended on behalf of gay people and there aren't even any gay people there. Yes, mate, we know there aren't any gay people here. Do you know why there's no gay people here? Because of pricks like you sitting in the corner saying crap like that. I would love there to be some gay people here, but they're avoiding this space because you're polluting it with your toxins. If you shut the fuck up, maybe there will be some gay people here. Remember when Louis C.K. said he was willingly withdrawing from comedy because he'd talked for a long time and now it was time for him to listen? <clears throat> and if you don't know the story for some reason, Louis C.K. is an American comedian uh, who had a habit of masturbating in front of unwilling women. Ten years later, uh, ten months later, sorry, ten years later would have been a reasonable time. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I assumed it must have been 10 years later that he came back, but no, it was in fact under a year. It was under 10 months later he came back and non-consensually foisted himself on a comedy audience by jumping out from behind a curtain and doing a quick comedy wank in front of them. A type 10, if you will, or a baggy eight. And then somebody recorded it on their phone and he said, that's not fair. It was new material. I didn't give permission for it to be recorded and put onto YouTube. Oh, did you not consent to that, Louis C.K.? Did you not? Wow, that must be really awful for you. Did someone make you feel like they didn't respect the social contract you had? And did they make you feel violated? You can't imagine what you're going through when your material, which you were happy to do in public, was distributed more widely in public than you'd intended. That must be so awful for you. I feel so much empathy for you. And because he did not consent to it, guess what? Oh, he's managed to have it all taken off the internet. Yes, that's right, because when Louis C.K. has things happen to him that he doesn't like, they magically go away. Anyway, in that set, which admittedly was material he was developing, uh, he said, I'm a little disappointed in the younger generation, honestly, because I'm 51 years old, and when I was like 18 to my 20s, we were idiots. We were getting high, doing fucking mushrooms and shit, and older people were like, you gotta get your shit together, and we were like, hey, fuck you. And I was kind of excited to be in my 50s and see people in their 20s and be like, they're crazy, these kids are nuts, but they're not, they're fucking nuts. Nah. They're just boring, fucking tell you, you shouldn't say that. What are you, an old lady? What the fuck are you doing? Nah, that's not appropriate. Fuck you, you're a child. Now I expected to get more laughs doing Lucy K's material, <laughs> but not one, interesting. Now, what he's basically saying there is, 
When I was young, I rebelled in ways that the older generation disapproved of. Not like these young people, who are rebelling in ways I disapprove of. <laughs> Really, this generation isn't rebelling the way your generation rebelled, Grandad. Wow, what a fucking surprise. And what's he saying? Like, when I was young, I did mushrooms. I was so subversive. What he's not taking into account is that when he was 18, fuck all was happening. These young people who are 18 now are living in a hallucinogenic trip day and night. Trump is in the White House. Have you seen what he's tweeting? And by the way, Louis C.K., he's tweeting. These kids have a little device in their pocket telling them everything everyone's saying in the world all of the time. That is a fucking trip. What you had was a newspaper that you didn't read because you were off your face on mushrooms trying to make the world more interesting. They don't need their world to be more interesting. The United Nations have said that if we don't slow climate change in 12 years, it's unslowable. And they are going to die in a fiery furnace. They are already tripping, mate! Thank you, Mushroom, don't you did hallucinogens. Oh my God. What was his 18 in the 80s? Jesus Christ, that's so old school for him to be. I was being LSD, I'm so cute. <laughs> You're so much cooler than young people who are literally marching to Washington. Yeah, you're so much more interesting than those people. And on that, he says, uh, these young people, they're like royalty. They tell you what to call them. You should address me as they, them, because I identify as gender neutral. Okay, you should address me as there because I identify as a location and the location is your mother's cunt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They testify in front of Congress, these kids. This is about the Parkland victims. What the fuck, what are you doing? You're young, you should be crazy, you should be unhinged, not in a suit saying, I'm here to tell you. Fuck you, you're not interesting because you went to a high school where kids got shot. Why does that mean I'd have to listen to you? How does that make you interesting? You didn't get shot. Yeah, yeah. That is the empathy level of a man who said he was going to go away and come back when he had listened. Seems like the first thing he's listened to, he's immediately gone out and mocked. And here's the thing. Al, oh, these kids aren't subversive. They're telling me what to say. These kids are so subversive. They're overthrowing the idea of gender in their rever fucking Lucian. That's amazing what they're doing. These kids are not taking no for an answer. These kids are the most rebellious generation we've ever seen. They are using due process. They're taking days off school. They are organizing their own rallies and they are looking at Louis C.K.'s generation and saying, you are fucking this world up and it is soon to be ours. I would not be surprised if these kids did away with the idea of gravity before they are done. They are overthrowing everything they don't like, everything that the previous generations have left them and everything that they can see. And they are doing it with empathy for others. They are standing up for each other. And Louis C.K.'s generation can only see, or at least the powerful figures in it, seem to be only able to see things from their own point of view. There's Louis C.K. going, I like to be called he, so it's good enough for everybody. I can't imagine not wanting to be called he because then I would have to think about something from someone else's point of view. And unfortunately, to do that, I would have to stop wanking. And unfortunately, that is a full-time occupation for me. Oh, I've come again. Oh, I've come again. I'm such a fucking revolutionary. I'm so rebellious. Why aren't the young people coming and then coming again and then doing LSD and then coming again? That would be so revolutionary. Oh my God, I've come again. I've come again. Is there anybody watching? Because that would make it better for me. I'm not allowed to do that anymore because I got found out after lying about it for years. I'm such a rebel that every single time a woman said that I'd done that, I just went, no, I haven't, and then kept on taking money from television networks. I'm such a rebel. Oh my God. And he said, by the way, 
On one day, he lost $35 million. He complained about that. He said, yeah, I lost $35 million. I'm like, I don't, I can't feel sorry for anybody who has $35 million. <laughs> I'm sorry. You had it. You were given so much privilege. You fucking took it. And then what did you do with that? You literally spunked it up a wall. <laughs> I have no empathy for you whatsoever. What so fucking ever? And then he said, what are you gonna do? Take, I don't care, someone walked out. And he went, what are you gonna do? I don't care, what can you do to me? Everything bad that's ever happen, happened could happen to me. Oh, really, really? And he went, I'm paraphrasing that bit, but it was basic that. And then he said, what are you gonna do? Take away my birthday? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would like to start a petition that we take away Louis C.K.'s birthday. <laughs> I don't know what day it is. I haven't looked it up because I can't be bothered. I don't care enough, but let's say it's the 4th of September. Let's whip it right out, <laughs> like he did. Thank you very much. <laughs> Deborah Francis White! <laughs> Our first guest is a stand-up comedian whose TV appearances include Have You Been Paying Attention, Rose Haven, and Whose Line Is It Anyway? Our second guest is the Sydney Covener, which sounds like a coven. Is it not convener? It's cover, Covener. It says Covener. I think we'd better ask her when she comes yeah, out. Yeah, we will. We might need to read this again. Uh, <laughs> of the group's Mums for Refugees, whose aim is to work towards an Australia which treats asylum seekers and refugees with dignity and compassion. Please welcome to the stage Susie Youssef and Dulcie Munoz. First of all, Dulcie, yeah. are you the Sydney Covenor, <laughs> convener or governor? I'm a convener, but sometimes I'm a part of a governor. <laughs> so you're part of a cover, so it really yeah. means convener. Yeah. It, so oh, you yeah. convene. I convene a message. I like to think covenor. I like that too. Head, Maybe we head should of change the it. Yes. That looks like covenor to me. I'm it's sorry. Totally is that how you spell convener? No, it's no. an ex there's an end missing. Yeah. That's nowhere near how you spell convener. So I that's covenor and I want that officially changed in the record books. We will. And I'm so happy that I didn't wrote that because my grammar is terrible. So Olivia and Sarah who always <laughs> checked my grammar, I didn't do it. <laughs> So first, Susie Youssef, you're Hello. one of Australia's favourite comedians. Oh. <laughs> and Twelve we, people agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> we've got you on because we can't be in Australia and not have you. That's, That's just very the way kind. it works. And do you, firstly, do you have an I'm a feminist butt for us? I kind of do. I'm not sure. I'm a feminist, but I bought laser hair removal because it was 50% off. <laughs> Thank you. Anything with lasers, anything with lasers, I don't want to group on. I want to pay, pay top dollar or not have it. I, this, I've seen group on laser eye surgery. Fuck the fuck off. I don't want some new kid doing 20 in an hour on my eyes. It'd be quite good if you could combine the two and go, I want you to do my top lip and fix my eyes. Mm. No, it or would. don't fix my eyes and I just won't see how hairy I am. <laughs> Chelsea, do you have an I'm a feminist butt? I do. Um, I do have a special bra for rallies. So I wear... <laughs> a protesting bra? Yes, it do, is. Uh, do your breasts need to be perkier during a protest? It does. I'm carrying a banner. I'm sweating. <laughs> I have a child with me all the time. You need, you know, you need equipment. You need technology. You need support. That's a feminist bra, and yeah, I'm a yeah. guilty feminist, but I have a bra. Listen, we're not burning our bras now. We are using them as feminist scaffolding. <laughs> they are engineering, they are support. But Dulcie, you did say, I wear that bra because it makes my Mums for Refugees t-shirt look really good. I know, that's all awesome. true. Did you, Dulcie? That's interesting. Well, it just makes the Mums for Refugees t-shirt look hotter. Of, look, we can't... 
I want the yummy mommy in the tagline when they say Dulce Muñoz, community of mom's refugee, yummy mommy, I will be fine. Like, I, I will take it in. So yes, that's why. So don't judge me, please. It's too late, sadly, Dulce. Tell us, firstly, who are Mums for Refugees? Okay, so Mums for Refugees is a grassroots network of mothers and carers that provide social, material, and legal aid to people seeking asylum and to people from refugee background. We are around Australia and New Zealand. We have 4,000 uh, members, and we have a pretty decent uh, social media presence with 98,000 social media followers. <laughs> Let's see if we can up that. Yes, please. By everyone here tonight retweeting and saying, please give these guys a follow. By guys, I do mean women. Yes. <laughs> and we do this with families and jobs, and this is what we believe, and this is we believe that we can change the perception of humanity in Australia. We believe that as mothers and women, we have a responsibility, and that we are game changers. So. If you're a mom or a carer and you want to join, we have working groups in Brisbane, Adelaide, Sydney, Canberra, and Perth. If you are not a mother uh, but you want to connect with us, we have a big Facebook page, so please join us. So you can join if you're a mother or not a mother? Yes. But it was started by some mums, so it's called Yes, Mums exactly. We, it's a very common mistake when, and we have received very angry emails saying, why just mums? <laughs> You know. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and look, as much as I would like this conflict and this issue of the refugees being about Susie or the other senders, <laughs> you know, it's not. It's about we started with playgroups and the way we engage with mothers was with mothers in detention centers and that's why we name each other Moms Refugees. We wanted to be clear that we have something to connect with them, that we understand that through motherhood, a lot of things simplified. So taking politics aside, this is a group about raising better individuals and as women having a voice and a say of what's happening in this country. Not a mother, as a member of the German aristocracy, <laughs> Baroness Wurm. Uh, I, I'm fine with it because I feel like not everything has to have me at the lead. I don't have to centre with everything, and I can always start my own place mm. up. Debra's for refugees. <laughs> I was, I was thinking Baron Wurm's for refugees, <laughs> but um, I, I only make that joke about myself. I just need to say that. It's all right for groups to step forward and say, this is our tribe, and as long as you're welcoming into other tribes, I think that's absolutely fine. You know, you're not excluding anybody, but you're saying, this is the impetus and this is the forefront, and the fact is you're doing loads to help refugees. Uh, what are you doing to help refugees? Okay, so this is a crucial year for us in Australia. This is election year. So I'm here to ask for your voice and your vote. I'm asking you, here for you to be aware in every conversation, be mindful of gender, race, religion, and privilege. Be aware that what is happening and when you are voting will affect the lives of hundreds of people. Right now we do play groups. We have an amazing play group in Lakamba and Parramatta that is for people seeking asylum. And sometimes this is the only day a week mothers seeking asylum can go out because they live in a very tight budget from the government and their visa, they don't allow them to work or study. So this playgroup allow them to learn English and have connections with the community. We have a campaign going on during election time that's called Put the Racist Last. So it's five tips of how to recognize a racist. And, <laughs> and it is basically be brave and these elections vote with your conscience and understanding how privileged you are because you're able to vote. We support the families that we just made bank from Nauru. So we call out for donations. A lot of them are gift vouchers or uh, new PGs for kids or anything. 
So just take a look in our Facebook page and you will see all the activities that we have. And what happened last time? You came on the Guilty Feminist Justice Charity of the Week and you did a call out for help and uh, then you got a great response. Yes, we did. Uh, so I was um, the charity of the night and I spoke a little bit of what we do and a lovely woman called Denise that moved to the States and I hope she will hear this approached me and said, look, I'm moving to the States. I have a car and I wanted to donate a car. And I say, oh my God, okay, yes, please. The car has been in three different families, three different families of people seeking asylum. And the last time was used to take a newly arrived refugee woman from Nauru to hospital. And it's little things like that. You can't imagine how the impact of having a car will do when you can't work and this is the only when you have to move around Sydney. So guilty feminists feel very proud of yourselves. You have made a change in this country. And yeah. Well we hope you get a lot more cars donated from this or anyone got a car or a flat in double bay? <laughs> I'm just, I don't, I'm one bed is fine. Um, that's absolutely amazing. You're saying it's an election year again in Australia. It's a federal election. Yes. So it feels like... State and federal. It feels like every time I come here, Australia, you have a new prime minister. <laughs> have you tried eHarmony? <laughs> it's because it's, it's not working out. It's like, what is going on? And you can't possibly be having another election it's a joke in other countries that there's no point remembering the name of the Prime Minister in Australia. Did you know that? Do you know there's a joke about you? I mean, I say you, I mean also me because I'm a dual citizen of Britain and Australia. We want this election though. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, because yeah. the current situation is interesting, less than ideal. <laughs> Which brings us on to our third guest. I just want to say that I've actually been doing some really good work as well. Um, <laughs> So not to, Dulcie, not to take away any of your thunder, no. but in 2014, I played um, the lead role in a play called The Boat People, and I was an Iraqi refugee who became a small business owner in Australia who became the first refugee prime minister of Australia. That was the storyline. So I am Peter Dutton's worst fucking nightmare. <laughs> so... I just... You know, we're all, mm. some of us are giving cars, I, I some of us are doing other things. I might be, I might be Peter Dutton's ideal woman because I'm not a citizen, so I can't vote. I am Peter Dutton's even bigger wet dream because I... Please don't ever say that sentence again. <laughs> no, because I'm a feminist who was born in Australia and left so not only do I not have a vote here anymore, because they take your vote away if you leave. Um, I, don't, I can't vote. Um, I think if you keep it up by postal vote or something, but I didn't know that. So if you... Well, you sort of lost touch and now they're like, oh, I don't know her. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I don't have the right to vote. I've taken my feminist opinions elsewhere and I only bring them back every now and again. So Peter Dutton is... He just takes one look at me and goes, four. <laughs> but then Dulcie was saying that, you know... Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, I will win this. <laughs> I'm Mr. Donald Trump, worst nightmare. I'm a Mexican, I'm an immigrant, I'm a feminist, I'm a brown woman, I'm a refugee advocate who takes Peter Dutton to court on a regular basis. <laughs> You are raising another feminist as well. Oh yes, my child is fierce. She just delivered her first um, speech in front of Parliament House. And she was wearing these kids of Nauru that the Refugee Council of Australia made her. And she, look, we have a rule in my house. We don't speak about refugees as refugees. We speak about people that are mom's clients because they are not refugees. They are just people seeking protection and asylum in this country. And we need to take that dirty, you know, subcontext of, in this world, refugee. 
So for my challenge, well, I'm going to speak in behalf of my friends and the friends that I meet in the attention centers and the friends that I Skype with and the friends for which we collect gifts in Christmas and so on. And she had her speech ready and she's eight. Um, and she's just standing there and then she goes like, I don't think I can do it, mom. And then the cameras went on and the media and they, I have the senators behind me and I went like, I will give you $5. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but <laughs> I, li I like that she knows her own worth. She's like, I am worth five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> and as your agent, I will take fifteen percent back. <laughs> Look, it wasn't my, you know, motherhood moment, but I also believe that advocates should be paid, and we. Should <laughs> So if you plan to book Victoria, she can do the speech in Spanish and English. She, sure. You know, you never So know. when the cameras came on her and you just said five dollars, she just went. She went like ready. Right, yeah. <laughs> you gotta win a little. Oh lose a little. She just went into stage school mode. Yes. Jazz hands. Well trained child, and then she performed, and you know, and all the pictures is my child going like and they think it's, you know, she's smiling to the parliament and to the senator. She's smiling because she got five dollars in her pocket. <laughs> Good. 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 She knows her worth. Feminist. Yes, Hashtag feminism. Yeah. Are you ready for the stand-up comedy? <laughs> then please welcome to the stage the one, the only, the phenomenal Carl Wilson! <laughs> So as previously discussed, I'm a total cat lady, I love animals, and I think it's really important for kids to have a pet because I think that pets help you develop empathy when you're a kid. And I know that my cats help me develop empathy because when my old cat Pod bit me on the thumb and it got infected and I had to have two lots of surgery because I had an abscess in my hand, my first thought was, oh now I know what the cats feel like when they've been in a cat fight. And my, my immediate thing wasn't, oh, I can't move my hand and I've got permanent damage. I was just like, oh, the poor things, they must hate it wearing a cone. And I didn't enjoy that part either. Um, <laughs> but what I found so interesting was when I, I had to have surgery on my hand and I was really scared of going into hospital because the only time I'd been into hospital before that was to be born and that had turned out well, but I didn't know... <laughs> how this would go. And so I was taken into hospital. I had this massive swollen hand. And do you know, my friends could have had more empathy at that stage. My left hand was massively swollen. It was grotesque. And all of my friends made the same joke. They'd go, huh, lucky for your boyfriend, it's not your right hand. And I'd be like, what? Am I some kind of hand job bandit? Like, what is, <laughs> what is going on? Like, and I don't, I don't reckon you'd find it particularly arousing if I like put my big swollen hand like, eh, let me touch you. With my abscess fingers. So I was already quite nervous. I was annoyed at everybody I knew who was making the hand job joke. And I got into hospital and I realized that even though it was only surgery on my hand, I had to get out of all of my clothes. Like, so I had to get into a hospital gown, which is like a paper serviette with sleeves. And uh, so I'm trying to get undressed and get redressed into the paper serviette. And the nurse, uh, who was lovely, said, you can leave your socks on. And I was like, oh, thank you so much because I was really worried about you seeing my feet. <laughs> And then lovely nurses, lovely nurses. I was really nervous. I freaked out that I wasn't going to have full anesthetic and I was going to be awake throughout the procedure. And the anesthetist came in because I was sort of crying. And he was like, what's wrong? I was like, well, I said, I'm going to be semi-conscious. And I'm just I'm so scared of pain. And he was like, it's all right, you'll be fine. And he went outside the door and he said to the nurse, we're giving her full anesthetic. And then he just did what he was going to do anyway and it was fine. Like he just beautifully lied to me and I had the semi-sedation, didn't remember a thing when I woke up. It was very weird going into theatre though, you kind of like wrapped like a burrito and they flip you onto the operating table. Two of the nurses recognised me from things I'd done on TV and as they were administering the anaesthetic, one of them went, haven't I seen you on skit? And then I was out. <laughs> I had to go back for surgery again a week later because the operation didn't work and I got another lovely nurse and he was tall and quite attractive but I didn't have a drink with a straw so I was alright. Uh, <laughs> So he, he puts me on the bed again, he's rolling me down, I'm wearing my paper serviette and my new different socks, and as he's going down the hallway with me, he starts talking to me and he goes, oh, I'm so glad that you've come back. I was really disappointed to miss out on you last time. <laughs> and 
I was like, oh, he must be a big comedy fan or something. And then he said, apparently, your hand exploded everywhere. <laughs> and that's when I discovered that nurses love to discuss pus. And it was quite shocking to me. And then I was sad for him that he had also missed out on that experience. <laughs> Pets are great for developing empathy, right? I think, <laughs> just leave it. I oh, know you're also, you're having empathy for that scene. You're empathizing with the kind of molten fireworks that happened out of my hand. Um, so pets can help you develop empathy. I believe they teach you responsibility when you're a kid. And I think that pets are also a really good way of um, teaching you about death as well. Like, obviously only if it happens organically. I'm not talking about if like, ah I've got fluffy, what do you reckon? Like. <laughs> I mean that they're a way to teach you empathy about things. And so when our first old cat pod died, which was entirely unrelated to the abscess hand, my son was about four or five, and I thought it was really important that Digby saw me be upset about it, because I loved that old cat. And so I showed him that I was sad, and I cried when I felt like crying, and he was sitting on my lap one day, and a tear fell onto his arm, and he went, oh look, a bit of mummy's sad came off. <laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna use that, thank you, my love. <laughs> he also said, a bit later on, it was about six when this happened, two of my friends had died unexpectedly and in quick succession, and I had also, he'd also seen me cry over that. And then I was in bed working on some work one morning, and I was concentrating, and he walked into the bedroom and went, oh no, mum, you've got your one of my friends has died face on again. I was like, we should probably work on a bit more empathy for that. Uh, but I was really, I was really determined that when our pets died, I wanted him to know that they had died and not tell him some other story like, oh, you know, they've gone to live on the farm. Like, I didn't want to do that to him. Did anyone have that told to them? Did anyone get that I've gone to live on the farm? I was talking to an audience the other night and this little boy put his hand up and he goes, my dad told me that our turtle went to live in Fiji. <laughs> it was really good. The dad just slid out of his chair onto the ground. <laughs> so... I always used to wonder though, like what do children who grow up on farms get told? Like, <laughs> like are their parents like, I'm so sorry love, Rusty's gone to live in the city and work as a barista. <laughs> so I finally got the answer to this one night. A woman put her hand up and said, I grew up on a farm. And I said, what did your parents tell you? And she goes, well, we got told they got lost down the back paddock. <laughs> and I went, how was that? And she goes, well, I got lost down the back paddock one day and I was shitting myself. <laughs> cat spook died I was overseas and that's just how it happened I'm not trying to establish an alibi or anything like that I was just <laughs> out of the country when he died and my husband did a really beautiful job of breaking the news to me like because he knew how much I loved the cat and so we FaceTimed he told me that spook had died and that he'd taken the cat to the vet for the vet to look after until I could get home and so I could say goodbye and my husband did a much more empathetic job of telling me that than the courier who told my husband that our cat had died. Because Spook had just died on the driveway in the sun, like he'd just gone to sleep and died. But the way the courier broke the news to my husband was, he knocked on the door and then he went, do you own an old black cat? And Chris went, yes, and he went, not anymore. But for me, the most beautiful part, the most beautiful part of the story, which is sad, was that the vet kept the cat for me for a couple of days in the freezer, which sounds weird if you're not into animals, and maybe even if you are, you're like, that's a bit weird, but I really wanted to say goodbye to Spook, because I'd had him for 16 years. And what I loved so much about our vet is that he brought Spook out, and he was all wrapped up in a towel, and he looked all comfortable and cosy. And as he was talking me through what he thought had happened to the cat, he was just stroking Spook, as if he was still, like, just stroking, stroking his ears and stroking his head, and I was like, that is so beautiful, or he is really unobservant. Thank you very much. Do you want to come to a live recording of The Guilty Feminist and hang out backstage with me and the other comedians? Or perhaps you'd like to have dinner with me and Cindy V and talk about feminism over cocktails? Thanks to the wonderful people at Comic Relief, those dreams can become a reality. Those are just two of the prizes on offer at the Comic Relief prize -thon. It costs only £10 to enter, but you can enter as many times as you like. Just Google Comic Relief prize -thon for all the details. The Guilty Feminist is going on tour in May. Me and some of your favourite Guilty Feminist comedians are pitching up into your town 
and we are going to have the all singing, all dancing night of your life. These shows will not be recorded, so the only way to find out what's in them is to come and see us live. Our third week of touring starts on the 15th of May when we will be in Cardiff, then we're going to Cambridge, Aylesbury, Bournemouth and Oxford. We're going to be all over the UK, so go to guiltyfeminist.com or Ticketmaster to see all the dates and times. My book, The Guilty Feminist, is still available from all good bookshops, but if you'd like me to read it to you with some help from the amazing Adua Ando, you can get the audiobook version by going to audible.co.uk and searching for The Guilty Feminist. And Global Pillage, the amazing diversity-paced comedy panel show starring you, the hive mind of the audience, is back and recording more live episodes on the afternoons of 23rd and 24th of March. Go to kingsplace.co.uk to book your tickets and come and play for Hive Mind Glory. Also, don't forget to check out Grown Up Land on BBC Sounds, another Spontaneity Shop podcast. Now, back to The Guilty Feminist. So this really does now lead us to our next guest. There was an historic bill passed in Australia this week, and it's the first time in 90 years that a government lost on a piece of legislation because they're in power, so they have all the sway. This piece of legislation was pushed through by independents, by Greens, and uh, by members of the opposition. And it wasn't expected to go through because obviously the government were against it. The government is currently run by the Liberal Party. Now, if you're listening internationally, that sounds lovely, doesn't it? The Liberal Party. Oh, sugar and spice and all things nice. It's an ironic title. It is. There is nothing liberal about the Liberal Party. It's a sarcastic name. Um, We are with the Liberal Party. If you like white male billionaires. Um, We're super liberal to them. So this law was passed uh, completely unexpectedly. And it was done because it was on a medical matter by a group of activist doctors. So our third guest today is one of the two doctors who wrote the letter which mobilized the medical community to support the Medivac bill. They wanted a thousand signatures from other doctors, but they got 6,500 doctors (laughs) to sign in 45 hours. And because... uh, Because it was put forward, the letter was put out on Saturday night, only three of those hours were business hours. They got people to do it over the weekend. 6,500 doctors said, I'm sorry, I've taken the Hippocratic Oath, and in Australia we don't treat people like this, and we don't stand by our government doing this. So this is absolutely historic, and it was completely grassroots. It wasn't by political doctors, it was by doctors who just went, "Mm, no, this isn't okay, and they threw their support behind it. It's absolutely remarkable because uh, this doctor, she works in palliative care. She's a GP, so she sees you know, people who come in with regular ailments we all have, but she also works in palliative care, and she works in a hospice for children. So she's like one of the most empathetic guests we could have got on. But if it wasn't for Sarah and uh, her friend Neela, this bill would not have been passed, and it speaks directly to the denial or acceptance of medical care being given to patients who are on Noru and Manus. They've been denied care for years. They've been suffering there. Doctors have said, this patient needs this. It can't be done here. They need to be flown to Australia. And the Australian Liberal government have said, no, we don't care. Let them suffer, let them die. And so this is absolutely remarkable. This is feminism in action. This is grassroots activism. This is the power of us. If you say this is not good enough, you don't have to be a person who understands parliament, who understands the law, who understands activism. You can just start. You can just say, I say this. Please help me. Please come around me. And it can happen. So please welcome to the stage the wonderful doctor, Sarah Townend.
Sarah warned me she might cry a bit, <laughs> but she hasn't even said anything yet. Um, if you're listening at home, Sarah just got a standing O for her work, which is absolutely right, because singers get standing ovations all the fucking time. Not today to the mm, sung a pretty tune. But have you liberated people in the way that Sarah has? No, you haven't, so. Yeah. Oh, I've done a Shakespeare play. It took two and a half hours. We were all bored by it, to be honest. <laughs> Do you know what that standing ovation was? It was begun by someone jumping to their feet to be first to the car park. <laughs> so there's that. Um, so, Sarah. Hi. Hi. You've really done, you and Neela have done something really remarkable. Could you please tell us about it? Where to start? I guess um, this is the second letter that we've written and the third that I've written, it seems to be a habit. Um, <laughs> and it all happened by accident. The first time that I wrote a letter, I um, was upset by an article in a newspaper about someone dying. That's my career. It's my privilege to help people die well. And I was so uh, upset about it that I thought, uh, I'll just write a letter. I googled how to write a letter to Peter Dutton, and uh, <laughs> and it just came up. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe that he didn't know, and I thought it must have been an accident that this man wouldn't do very well. Anyway, I was obsessed and told all of my friends. And about four days later, after my husband had built a website because I was cutting and pasting from a word document, and the medical bodies in our community came out and also advocated for this particular man. He was flown to Australia. And it was an astonishing thing. It was astonishing um, because I felt so underqualified and such a beginner. I am just a regular GP and I do just see one person at a time. And so to raise my voice and have it work to help somebody was just extraordinary. So time went on and I discovered that it wasn't an accident, that it was a deliberate policy by our government of cruelty and bad medical care that's killing people. And I couldn't look away. And so when the opportunity came to participate in the Kids Off Nauru campaign, and I had seen on a wonderful secret society of women doctors that there was a lovely doctor down in Melbourne, Dr. Neela Janakaramanan, I thought, I think she might help me. <laughs> um, and so I private message her and said, would you help me? And then she just jumped on board and, and we wrote a letter to bring the children off Nauru. And it took us three weeks banging on everybody's doors with all of our friends, all of our doctor's friends to collect six and a half thousand signatures. And I took the letter to parliament and delivered it. And the prime minister has never acknowledged that we asked for the children to come off Nauru. And I- Rude. Yes. <laughs> I have listened to every interview actually and he has mentioned health in this discussion twice and the whole of the medical community in Australia, all of our peak bodies, it's about 80 or 90 percent of the 100,000 doctors in Australia um, have spoken publicly about this issue, both about the children and about the health care of people out there and he has mentioned the word health twice. I think it's incredibly disrespectful. We're experts in that field for a reason. You know, we study for years and we know what's going on. It's unacceptable. So it came to our attention after we were absolutely exhausted from the Kids Off Nauru campaign, and they came. Um, and we should say again, if you're listening internationally, I may have made an assumption everyone knows what Manus and Nauru are, but they're islands offshore of Australia where, like Guantanamo Bay, people can be kept without the basic human rights that uh, anybody on Australian land is entitled to. So they're used like concentration camps, but they're used for refugees completely. You know, Guantanamo Bay is bad enough because you know people are just taken there on suspicion and they're not charged with anything. But Manus and Nauru are just any refugees, people who have been running from terror and hardship and terribly devastating things and children have been put in effectively what are concentration camps. And they're very clever because they tick all the technical boxes so they feed them and they clothe them but they do the bare minimum and so they try to say that it isn't as bad as what you've just said but they destroy their personhood and that in the end destroys their health and their identity. Well you were saying about the children when they were doing drawings they were somewhat disturbing. Yeah, so 
I mean, you, we all know what kids draw, and when these children draw, many of them have spent their whole lives on one of these islands, Nauru particularly, only men were taken to Manus. They draw things like um, the trauma that they've experienced in the past in their own countries, perhaps like helicopters and guns and that sort of thing, war-torn. But then they draw pictures of their own experiences with fences and tears and people harming themselves and blood and crying. It's devastating to see those pictures. Mm. And so you saw some of this evidence that this was happening. You were reading official reports. As a doctor, I appreciate that the media reports on these things, but I don't really trust what they say. So in order to have some sort of integrity approaching this issue, I chose to read only things that were official documents from either the government um, or from the World Health Organization or from the federal courts or from doctors who had been there themselves. And there's a couple who um, are not allowed back to the island because they spoke out against what was happening there, a growing number actually. And so they're up to date, there are, all in the last year, there were 48 federal court cases and all of these document with terrible coldness, the denial of care and the destruction of personhood. So there's one particular case where the government spent several tens of thousands of dollars to fight with their lawyers against bringing a child who had suspected encephalitis to Australia. You know, what universe is that okay in? Mm. Where um, is the empathy? Where is the humanity? Yeah, there is none. It's zero. It's brutal. And so the more I read, the more I just couldn't look away. And so I've been quite involved on several levels, but one is putting myself in a very, very incredibly uncomfortable position of speaking out. Um, I like to... <laughs> Um, it's quite frightening to sort of have to raise your voice against your government and say that they're wrong, but it's unavoidable when you've read the things that you've read. I, I just couldn't help it. And our medical bodies had spoken out and they have policies written about how, um, and there's huge bodies of research about how awful detention is for people's health and how destructive it is for children's lives and how this will go on to create for generations prolonged trauma. So they spoke out in the ways that they could, but there was a need to beat the drum. And Neela and I felt that although we didn't have a clue about, <laughs> about parliament um, or- Don't worry, the people there don't know anything about it <laughs> Or, you know, what do you do? Like, um, someone contacted me today because we've written just repeated letters and said, so what do you do when you write a letter to Parliament? And I was like, I don't know, write a letter. <laughs> um, dear Parliament. Yeah, dear Parliament, yeah. yes. Neela said in the press that she didn't know what Hansard was. <laughs> she didn't know that you could watch parliamentary proceedings on yes. the internet. So it's really grassroots. It's really like a busy doctor who hasn't got time to sort of engage with that or whatever, just going, hold on, this is an injustice. How do I learn what I need to learn to right that wrong and to bring my expertise to the party, to bring my personal power and shine a light on this? And you just learn those things. You can learn yeah. those things. It doesn't matter that you don't know what Hansel is. No. You can learn it. You can just Google it. Yeah. But you Sarah, totally. you're doing all of that outside of your work hours. So you're, if you don't mind me saying, you're a mother of two, you work in palliative care, you work full time as a doctor, and then in your spare time, mm. you're just bringing down horrible government policies. <laughs> same, same, yeah. So similar. I was like, yeah. yeah, it's like looking into a mirror, basically. Um, yeah. It's just when you said, oh, it's been so, speaking out is so hard, I was like, that's the only thing the three of us can do is speak out. That's the fun bit. That's yeah, the bit we, like, give me just, a microphone. We talk shit though, you're yeah. changing lives. Yeah, 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 I was like, wow, though, that is the only fun bit of what you do by the sound of it. Like, it's, it's like you're doing such remarkable things. So what inspires you? And I want to throw this to you, Dulcie, as well, because you have made this your mission. What drives you to go from thinking this is wrong to that extra point of making this your job to speak out? Because you've both taken it on like a job for me it was anger 
I think we need to acknowledge anger sometimes as a driver of change. I was, my child was born with um, talipis, clubfoot, nothing big. She was just need a little surgery when she was tiny. And the first pictures of Nauru were coming on and we were in a hospital. And I saw the woman with a baby and I saw myself there and she has the same skin color. She was my same age. The only difference between that woman and I is that I was a, from a privileged background and I came with a student visa and we paid for a master's degree and I was able to stay, nothing else. There's no difference, so I got really, really angry. And then um, I joined Moms to Refugees and love make me stay. I see the love of when we win and we're able to bring a family from Nauru, I see the love on the faces of the mothers that have crossed the ocean just to provide for their families. I see the love of my um, other members when we do play groups and when we are able to do something really meaningful for someone. So anger mm. and love, yeah, mm. that's it. That's really lovely, that's beautiful. So if you've got anger, use that anger as a propeller to motivate you to leave the house and then allow the love to drive you to stay and to give you that resilience. What about you, Sarah? There's two parts of it, I think. We were talking before about, I have a conscious practice as a doctor um, and as a GP, it's sort of like, being every 15 minutes, I get another go. Um, <laughs> or five, if you're not very nice. No, no. Um, <laughs> oh, the oh. NHS, it's, uh, it's, it's increasingly defunded. Yeah, yeah. Doctors are amazing, but you know, you can tell they're in a hurry. Anyway, sorry, continue. No, no, that's Every right. 15 minutes, yeah, so I, we morph into someone else. I have a conscious practice that each time someone walks into the room, I will help hold what they've come about and that it is a privilege to do so even if I struggle to like them and I try so hard to find something to like about each one. Um, <laughs> I want you to be my doctor, Sarah. <laughs> Me I'm too. very unlikable in a waiting room. <laughs> Me too. If I came in, what would you find to like about me? Would you be like, oh, <laughs> this is awkward. See, my, well, I'm a feminist, but until last week, I didn't know about the guilty feminist. <laughs> hey, <laughs> she's so busy. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. She's, she's just been changing the fucking the world. world. She works in palliative she care, is. and she's been getting sick people off Nauru. Come on. <laughs> yeah, but oh, honestly, You haven't been listening to comedy podcasts. <laughs> Unfashionable. But just as, a, just as a piece of advice, just pop a podcast in as you're writing a letter. You can, it's, it's multitasking. You'll be fine. It's very easy. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that conscious practice means that I view, it comes out of my view of how valuable each person is. And so each person, whether they're here in my office, and I decided this year, man, it's too slow doing it one at a time. I just have to get out there and do more. It's an odd thing, but a doctor sees something of their own patients in these people. So I feel like I can know some of them and some of what they m must experience because I see it in my patients, the same kind of intensity of feelings, different circumstances altogether, but the same kind of intensity of feelings and they just want to live like we do. So that's one part. And then the other is, I really like justice. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, an, it's irritating that my patients here, I can fight for them and access care and speak loudly and I can make their deaths better than they would have been and I can respect them and nobody's doing that for these people. Mm. And I just I can't stop now. No. I, I, Sarah, you, I'm, I'm just so astounded by you and your generosity of spirit in what you're doing. But I also love that you've just given yourself a tagline that would be wonderful on a Marvel superhero movie of I really like justice. <laughs> Big fun. My favourite ice cream flavour is justice. <laughs> Sarah, do you have to be careful of your own self-care? Is it easy to take on too much and hold it in your body? 
I participate in writing reports now for the federal court and so I do get to read my colleagues and I must be clear that there are doctors who are trying to do a good job out there. So I read their words about how they've tried to care for these people and but they don't I, have the resources and the facilities and no, they're stopped from doing their job. They're powerless, like they're being destroyed as well. Mm. I guess this is my first therapy session in about six months. It's great. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true, probably, actually. It's probably your first therapy session that's not up the standing ovation. <laughs> I'd yeah. love it if I went in and have a therapy session and the therapist <laughs> just stood up and just floored me as I walked in. I'd be like, I'll pay double for that. <laughs> and do you know what? I don't even need the therapy session now. I'm off. I would happily pay for that. Just come in, audience, standing O in the morning, out again. Um, <laughs> I would totally love that too, but my therapist thinks I have delusions of grandeur, so she can't <laughs> You just can't beat it. Oh. Thank you for all your work, Helen. Uh, can I? My. <laughs> I also have delusions of grandeur, but they are. I don't know how to put this. Is he grander than yours? <laughs> yeah, you're fucking posh, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mirror from Mira's wedding. It's all put on. Um, sorry, Sarah. You were saying something important <laughs> about yourself. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> Ask your question about your self-care, and then the comedians interrupted to get <laughs> jacks. Uh, uh, one thing I've forgotten to acknowledge in this is that Neela and I may have made ourselves available to lead the charge of the grassroots doctors, but there have been thousands of us, and there is a really strong support network because we have a different skill set and view the world in a, with a slightly different filter. It's really important that, um, and they've been very kind, and I have lent on them because. I am ashamed and complicit um, and carry around their stories inside me and until this is right, I can't stop. So it is heavy um, for me. But there is a wonderful community of doctors and others who have supported us in this and they're a bit bonkers too in that they, um, you know, we, we decided, oh, we'll make a poster and so <laughs> doctors are not halfway people and the next thing we knew, it was up and down the east coast Often doctors live in the same streets as MPs, so you know, that may or may not have happened. Um, and we put a call out for, you know, uh, is there any doctors who would be in regional towns around Australia who could stand up and say they signed one of the letters? The media people asked us if we could get 10. And so I thought, yeah, all right. And so I put a little note on um, a social media site a secret society of wonderful women. And the next morning, <laughs> the media person had 92 answers. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not just been us. It's been an extraordinary community of men and women doing what they can do and raising their voice in their way and caring mm. for the refugees and talking to government. They won't talk to me, but they'll talk to some of them. Yeah. And this is what feminism is. It's people getting together and saying, we like justice and, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and we, we, feel, we feel anger and we need a place of love to drive that anger forward and turn it into justice. So between the two of you who've both, you've only really properly met tonight, haven't you? We have done, like, we have been in rallies together. But I didn't have a good bra. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but, but tonight, tonight you've, you've sort of properly met. It was my first one, the rally. Yeah, well, tonight you've sort of properly met and you've both accidentally worn exactly the same shade of red. <laughs> and I feel like the two of you are going to team up and fight crime. Yeah, you both look fierce as fuck. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> exactly, you have pulled it out of the bag. I'm a feminist, but uh, you have worn the sexiest outfits. <laughs> on to this show to talk about your incredible activism that I could possibly imagine. And now that Sarah's been so funny, I feel like Susie and I need to examine people just to redress the balance. <laughs> Dulcie, is there anything that you would like to say that you think will inspire people? Because there are people in this country who will be able to connect with or help mums for refugees, but there'll be people who'll want to start their own thing or join something else. There'll be people who won't be near a local group of mums for refugees who would like to you know, leave the house, get their hands dirty. 
and people all around the world who will feel this way too. What advice can you give people for actually getting something done? They don't need it to be easy, but they do need it to be simple. And uh, increasingly, I think we need to make it simple. What simple instructions can you give people? First, if you're in social media, get active. Social media is wonderful. We grow Moms Refugee from a tiny um, Facebook group, and now we have a movement. But don't stop there. Go out of your house and ask to be aware of your privilege. Please, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you are a talent, please ask if we need your help. There is nothing wrong to ask for your friend. And then three is stop having discussions about who is right and who's wrong. This is beyond that, you know? This is about learning. And it's a process of allyship. I think my ask is be a good ally, be a good ally to marginalized communities be a good ally to your friends who are struggling and understand that allyship is a long life process and it's okay to make mistakes. Don't be afraid. It's okay if it doesn't work. We have tried many, 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 many times. And sometimes there are only 10 people in a rally and we call it a rally, by the way. <laughs> it's not a and gathering. And two of them your daughter. Yes. <laughs> and we are proudly standing there with our banners and Every little act of kindness counts. And I think that's the most important thing that I can leave you with. Be kind to yourself and be kind with others. And when you read the news, ask yourself, is this coming from a place of kindness? Is this coming from a place of privilege? Is this taking me somewhere? And if it doesn't, just chuck it up in the garbage and buy better news, you know, buy the Guardian <laughs> or... <laughs> Yeah, can I say again, please, I know we did a big episode on this that some of you all have listened to. We have to pay for a free press. We have to. Journalists need to be paid or they cannot investigate those stories. If they cannot do it out of the goodness of their hearts because they have rent to pay and they have kids and they have, you know, and the amount of time, the hours to break those stories it takes, you need a crack team on that. So unless we want a press that's 10, fun ways to smash the patriarchy. If we're happy with that, then fine. But otherwise we have to pay. And we used to buy a newspaper every day and now we don't do that. So just start giving $5 or $10 a week or whatever, however many, you know, if you think I read the news every day, that's a dollar a day, $7 a week, fine. But just give that. And if you can't give that, what can you give? Can you give a dollar a week? Can you give a dollar a month? All of that will help. But we've got to start paying for it because Trump is talking, your friend Trump, Dossie. Uh, I'm a scary creature behind the wall. Yes. He, he's talking about a state, he wants a state-run press. And that is fascism, end of story. We have to get ahead of that. Yeah. Like that's just, it's just fundamental. And we cannot let Rupert Murdoch take over the whole world with his poison. He has poisoned our well for too long and generated this idea that people who are who were born on the other side of an imaginary line or, you know, have more melanin in their skin are somehow frightening, dangerous, trying to take your bit of the part. He's doing that for his own ends and his own reasons. And we cannot play into it anymore. We've got to become the journal. We all edit a newspaper now. We all do. If you have a Twitter account, you're editing a newspaper. If you have a Facebook page, you're editing a newspaper. Who are you going to amplify? Who are you going to promote? My mother will be thrilled I have a different job. <laughs> You're editing a newspaper. Tell me that. Tell me, I've, listen, Mum, my Twitter feed, I'm a newspaper editor. I give my mum a lot of shit all the time for comedy value, but I will say this <laughs> on the topic of empathy. She's the first person that I thought of when you told me the theme of this podcast. And she said, I told her about the other guests. She was very excited. And she said, it's so important when you become exhausted by these topics to take a deep breath and remember that these people, I feel emotional because it's the nicest thing she's ever said. Um, <laughs> take a deep breath and remember these people have names and faces and families and dreams. Mm -hmm. And she said, you have a platform, Susan, and it's so important that you speak on this topic and remember that, you know, like you said, that the word refugee is really dehumanizing sometimes. Like these are, 
These are people who are just like me, who are just like you, and it's so important that people who have the opportunity to use their incredible voices like the two of you, that you're doing the work that you're doing, but it's our responsibility to listen to those stories and to hear fellow human beings speaking their truth as well and to not be just immediately exhausted by this topic that is saturated and then disappears and doesn't get um, momentum anymore, to take a deep breath and to remember that these are fellow human beings. Yes. And if you're feeling hopeless, stimulate yourself with new people, reconnect, find out what someone else is doing about it. Because I feel this, we've done a lot about refugees and we go to Calais, you know, we've really focused on this, but I feel really refreshed and reconnected by meeting the two of you and hearing about all your incredible work. And I think re-stimulating ourselves, finding a new way of looking at it, new people to connect to, you get energy from other people. Yeah. So I'm going to ask everybody before we go, Cal, do you have anything else to tell us about or anything else you'd like to say? Any final words on empathy or anything you'd like to plug? Oh, I'm not going to plug something after Susie's gorgeous speech. <laughs> Cal's got a children's book out. It's called George and the Giant Bum Stampede. <laughs> um, it's a very serious book. Um, <laughs> is it Giant Bum Stampede? It is. It's George and the Giant with, with the Great Bum Stampede. Great. Um, sorry, I knew it was... It's not giant. great, it's not giant, it's not Sorry. outrageous. It's just yep. a great bum stampede, as they all should be. Um, if you've got a child, buy that book. Yes, please do. As my neighbour's child said, it's very reasonable. It's not much of a rip-off. Um, <laughs> How empathetic of them. I said, and have you read it? And you went, no, no, but I've bought it. So, Same. Take yes. their money, Cal. Take their money. <laughs> I'm touring my show this year. It's called Gifted Underachiever, so that will be going all around Australia. What an honour and a privilege to share the table with Sarah and Dulcie. Mm, you really. You've blown me away. You're amazing. <laughs> Susie Yusuf, any final words on empathy or anything to tell us about that you'd just, like us to know about? Just say that thing again, because it was so fucking great. Oh, <laughs> well, we, um, can edit, we can edit it in. Okay. Repeat. No, I will say um, I will say that the thing that I learned about when I started to look into empathy uh, many years ago under the guidance of Helen, thank you, Helen, um, <laughs> is that empathy fuels connection, and it also destroys shame. And those words just ring in my ears that sympathy is from a place outside, looking in, and empathy is standing next to someone and feeling with them. And yeah, I can't. I. I mean, we're all, we all have goosebumps and are very shaky in the voice at these incredible women. And, and also, Deborah Francis White, who is one of the most generous, wonderful human beings. But, yeah. so it is only my honour and privilege to, to know this amazing audience who will come out and sit and connect with us and be here in our laughter and be here in our tears and to amplify voices like all of these four women on the stage tonight. Uh, but especially in the spirit of this evening and empathy, Dulcie and Sarah. And Dulcie, is there anything else you would like us to know about Mums for Refugees? Okay, in a spirit of being very honest, there is a collection bar over there. Please donate. It has lights on everything. My child helped me put it on. Oh, it's a box with lights on? Yes. Pop a car in? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, oh, look at that. that. Too. Yes. So, oh, that's brilliant. Every single penny that you donate to Mums for Refugees will go to help a family seeking asylum in Australia, families that are not able to work, families we are in a very tight budget. We make a difference. I have the privilege of witness the first haircut in five years of a woman who have been in a room and the transformation that that's entitled, you know, regain humanity. So when they told me that today is empathy, I wanted to tell you that empathy is a skill. Some people are born with, you know, a better skill than others, but it's something that you can learn. Solidarity is the action of that skill and allyship is a process in which we create change. So we have a long way to go to start using your empathy. Thank you very much. Wonderful. And if you're listening at home, if you came to the show, you paid for your ticket, there's no obligation, but Mums Refugees would really appreciate anything you've got on you, whether that be a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars or an Audi. Um, <laughs> But if you're listening at home, how can you donate? Yes, go to our Facebook, Mums for Refugees. We have a couple of donations and drives going on. Mums for Refugees on Facebook? Yes, please. And if you are listening at home, the podcast is free. So you, if you wouldn't mind popping something into the Mums for Refugees tin, 
on Facebook, it lights up in the same way that the buckets do. Um, Sarah, is there anything you'd like us to know? Anything you haven't left on the table that you would like us to hear about? There are many things in the world that need our hearts. And I've learnt in this last six months that it was very important for me to listen very closely to what stirred my heart and what made me upset. I don't have time to do it all, so you guys need to listen to yours because there are so many needs in the world that deserve our attention. And if you listen carefully, there's a small present that's been given to you and then it's yours to do something with. And the final thing is, don't forget your manners or your kindness. <laughs> oh my God, Sarah, run our country. It is amazing. Jeez. That is so beautifully put. Oh my gosh. Sarah. Sarah, I love that you've told us to listen to our hearts, but you can also listen to our hearts because you're a doctor. <laughs> But we have to listen to our own hearts as well. Yeah. I yeah so it's, oh, it's like a metaphysical stethoscope where we can listen to our hearts. That's unbelievable. Have you thought about writing songs for Celine Dion? <laughs> oh, and if you do, please call your band Metaphysical Stethoscope. <laughs> yes. Okay, so if you could follow us at Guilt Firm Pod or me at Deborah FW. If you could follow us on Instagram, The Guilty Feminist or uh, DF Dubs. Uh, you could like our Facebook page. And if you could go to iTunes and rate, review, and subscribe, it helps other people find the podcast. If you don't give this episode five stars, you hate feminism. <laughs> so... You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest star host Al Wilson, and our very special guests, Susie Yusuf, Dulcie Munoz, and Dr. Sarah Talman. Producers for Thomas Selinsky for the Spontaneity Shop and Jeff Brim for Australian Comedy Management. Music is by Mark Hodge. Thanks to everyone at the Factory Theatre as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this other episode, visit GuiltyFamilist.com. She's in the second row. She's, yeah, it's done. What's your name, by the way? Lady oh. Tim. <laughs> too shy to say my name. Not, not after all the heckling. No. You can use a fake name. Just if we... It's fee. Fee? Yes. Was it, was it fee or fiend? I think fee like, it's not about the money, money, money. Like that kind of fee. F-double-E. Oh, okay, right. I was wondering what the fuck not was happening. Money, money. <laughs> it's not about the prize tag. <laughs> um, it's... Born fee, <laughs> as fee as the wind blows. Oh, I thought it was like, oh, you're taking fee to the Guilty Feminist podcast. You're going to pay for that. <laughs> oh! Oh, oh no. I, no, I'm... Please, someone walk me to my car.